Good morning. I'm Joanne Peters, one of the newest members of the Worship Associates. I'm pleased to be your Worship Associate here at Unitarian Universalist Church, Community Church of Santa Monica. Today's service is Listening with the Heart. You know, I've always been a listener. I think it comes from the last vestiges of the era, children should be seen and not heard. As a listener, I became aware of the effect, cha facial change, body language, and the change emotional energy can have on a room. Not to mention tonal inflection and tonal inflection placed on a syllable or a word. Looking back now, it's no wonder I became a sign language interpreter, not only by to be a voice for the perceived voiceless, but also to be the advocate to assure that deaf and hard of hearing people are heard. As a sign language interpreter, the job is not simply hearing what is spoken and converting words into relative signs, nor is it a task of stringing spoken words together to match random hand gestures and configurations. It's really a skill of intentional listening, listening for the expressed and unexpressed meaning, noticing nuances that enrich the words chosen and the signs chosen. It's also understanding how the speaker or the signer uses language. An interpreter must be willing to be fully present in the moment and speak and sign from that place of understanding. So when I use those techniques in my conversations with friends and family, I find that compassionate deep listening and reflection positively changes our interaction to one of a supportive and fulfilling experience. Please light the chalice with me. Listening. We are drawn to people who understand us. And how do we know we are, they understand us? Because people who understand us ask questions, listen to the answer, encourage us to elaborate, and respond directly to what we say. Real attention is one of the most nicest and meaningful gifts we can give one another. I like this chal chalice in honor of listening.
Good morning. I am the Reverend Kikanza Nuri Robbins, and I welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Community Church of Santa Monica. We are very glad that you were here with us this morning. Our church building and the homes of most of our members are on the traditional ancestral and unceded land of the Gabrielano Tongva people, people who lived here and cared for this land thousands of years before us. We pause to honor those who lived here before us and to acknowledge that the land we claim to be ours, perhaps, is not. Unitarian Universalism is not defined by creed or dogma, but is guided by principles that affirm the worth and dignity of every person and encourage an individual search for truth and meaning. We honor the wonder of existence and believe that we are all connected to one another and to the interdependent web of life. Our beliefs are drawn from scripture and science, nature and philosophy, personal experience and ancient tradition. We are a congregation made up of people who believe in God and people who don't. People who are content to live with the mystery and people who will never stop searching for answers. In Unitarian Universalism, you can bring your whole authentic self, all of your identities, your questioning mind, and your expanding heart. We are diverse in many ways, seen and unseen, and we are united in our advocacy for social justice, and our covenants with one another. I hope you find our company and our conversation safe and welcoming. I hope you find this service inspiring and challenging, and I hope that you will come back and join us again. We are very glad to have you with us this morning. Many people have contributed to this worship service. The Reverend Jeremiah Callanday is our developmental minister. I am a community minister, and when I'm not preaching here, I preach around Southern California, and I teach and consult with nonprofit organizations. And I am honored that the Reverend Jeremiah so generously shares the pulpit. You have already met Joanne Peters, who is one of our new worship associates. Our multi-talented director of music, Sonder Choi, directs and produces all of the music in our service, and he also edits the entire service. The remarkable Ryan Humphrey provides our in instrumental music, and our vocalists this morning are Javon Haskin, Michael Mirzma, Chloe Vaught, and Kelsey Hahn. This morning, we have some special music from one of our members. Leslie Kernikin has written a song that she will sing this morning with Nate Widelitz, who is joining her in the singing. Behind the scenes, helping with technology are Pam Teplett and Elizabeth Fuller. They prepare the slides and make sure that our services are streamed. They handle all the technology stuff. So stuff that sounds simple when I say it only because I don't really understand it. I just am very, very grateful that they do it and they do it so well. If the streaming is glitchy this morning through Facebook or you are distracted by the comments that are going on underneath the screen, watch in the comment section for directions to a link. Pam and Liz will provide a link to another site where the streaming is smoother. It's on YouTube and where there are no comments. So it's a little quieter for you. And it'll be announced a couple of times in the comments. So if you don't get it, don't worry, you will get it. And then after the service, also in the comments, Pam and Liz will direct you to our live coffee hour. So this is an opportunity for you to see 
other people who have been worshiping with you and to talk with them live, not by comments, but, but by talking. So bring your coffee and join us for the live coffee hour. We have two announcements this morning. We have a high and we have a low. The high is that the West Side Coalition for Hunger, Housing and Health will be awarding Dr. Charles Haskell, one of our members, their highest honor for volunteers. This is going to take place at their Celebration of Success Breakfast on Thursday, October 22nd at 8.30. So you can go to the West Side Coalition website and purchase a ticket at Dr. Haskell's table so that we can be there to cheer him on when he receives his honor. Our Faith in Action program has participated in the West Side Coalition programs for hunger, housing, and health for almost 20 years. And Charles has helped them in many ways, including sharing his gift of photography. So we say congratulations, Charles. We're very proud of you and proud that you are one of us. The low this morning is that Maria Elena Gonzalez, who is the partner of Kayla Metzger, another of our members, they have been partners for 20 years. Maria died a week ago on October 8th from complications from Lou Gehrig's disease. We hold Charles and Chela in the light as we celebrate with them, as we hold them up and offering comfort as they mourn. and hand. May we this time and place transcend to make our purpose understood. Our mortal search for mortal good, our firm commitment to the goal of justice, freedom, peace for all. A mind that's free to seek the truth, a mind that's free in age and youth, to choose a path no threat impedes, wherever light of conscience leads, a martyr's died so we could be a church where kind a heart to search makes love the spirit of our church where we can grow and each one's gift is sanctified and spirits lift where every door is open wide for all who choose to step Please join me in our covenant. Love is the doctrine of our church. The quest for truth is our sacrament and service is our prayer to dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve humankind in fellowship. Thus do we covenant with each other.
Good morning. Today's story is about a little boy named Shakir. Now, Shakir lived with his aunt and uncle and his cousin, Susie. Now, his uncle was a mechanic. He worked on all sorts of cars and trucks and even an occasional jetpack. But he was so busy talking to colleagues and clients and even just his friends about driving cars on the weekends that he didn't have time to listen to Shakir talk to him about what happened at school. And Shakir's aunt, well, she was a florist and she made beautiful arrangements for weddings and for churches and for school celebrations. But she was so busy she never had time to listen to Shakir talk about what happened at soccer practice. Well, and his cousin Susie, well, she was in high school. She was busy on the debate team and finishing book reports. She didn't have time to listen to Shakir tell her the stories that he'd made up. And so slowly, but surely, Shakir's ears began to shrink. They got smaller and smaller, and smaller, until eventually, they were gone. Now, Shakir didn't really notice a difference. No one had ever listened to him, so it kind of only made sense that he couldn't listen to anyone. Now he couldn't listen to his teachers at school, or Susie, or anyone, but no one seemed to notice. It seemed like everyone was walking around, hearing, but not really listening. Until one day, he got a new babysitter. And he was getting ready to break out his Legos after his aunt and uncle and his cousin Susie had all gone out to their various activities. And his babysitter said, how was your day at school? Shakir blinked and tilted his head. He wasn't really sure what to do exactly. The babysitter looked at him and she said, what did you do today? Did you paint? Uh, did you work on the alphabet? And slowly, one activity after the other, he told her about his day. And that night when he went to sleep, the sides of his head felt a little tingly, but he didn't think about it too much, and he went to sleep. Well, two weeks later, the same babysitter came back, and she said, Oh, I see you're still in your baseball uniform. How was practice? And he blinked and told his head. But this time, it didn't take him quite as long. He told her all about hitting a home run. Well, it was almost a home run. And then he told her about trying out to be the pitcher. And that night sides of his head felt a little knobbly, but he didn't think anything of it. Now, every couple of weeks, the same babysitter came back, and she'd ask him all sorts of questions, and eventually she started asking him, do you have any interesting stories? And he would make up stories for her. And as he brushed his teeth and got ready, he would look in the mirror, and his ears were growing back. Eventually, after a whole year of listening and talking and telling his story and listening to her funny stories, his ears had grown back completely. His aunt and his uncle and his cousin noticed and were a little confused and they said, how did you get them back? And he looked at each of them and said, tell me about your day. And that is the end of our story this morning. Time.
we continue to celebrate the small and large joys, birthdays, births, jobs, family, health. We celebrate Charles Haskell for the honors he received from the West Side Coalition. In our community and in the circles of love that make up our worlds, we celebrate and we are grateful. We continue to mourn for our large and small losses, celebrations we didn't have, vacations we didn't take, jobs we no longer can go to, animal friends that are no longer with us, health that fails, and bodies that mock us. We mourn with Chela, who is grieving the loss of her beloved Maria. In our own community and in the circles of love that make up our worlds, we weep for the things we no longer have. We grieve as we adjust to the love-shaped holes in our universe, and we give thanks for the time that we have had with the people we love. Have you ever wished that someone would just stop talking and listen to you? Have you ever felt you were listening to someone, but even though you understood the words, you were missing the meaning? Sometimes rather than listening with your ears and processing with your brain, you need to listen with your heart and take in the meaning of the message there. Heart tones heart songs, heart sounds. When should you shift from the head to the heart? How can you use both head and heart? You can make it a spiritual practice. You can approach the speaker with the appropriate listening attitude. Holy listening becomes holy listening. Gary Kowalski talks to us about listening with the heart. Maybe prayer doesn't mean talking to God at all. Maybe it means just listening, unplugging the TV, turning off the computer, quieting the mental chatter and distractions. Maybe it means listening to the birds and the insects, the wind and the leaves, the creaking and groaning of the trees. Noticing, who else is out there, not far away, but nearby, sitting so still we can hear our heartbeat, watch our breath, the gentle whoosh of air, the funny noises from our own insides, marveling at the body we take so much for granted. Maybe it means listening to our dreams, paying more attention to what we really want from life and less attention to all the nagging, scolding voices from our past. Or maybe it's all about listening to each other, not thinking ahead to how we can answer or rebut or parry or advise or admonish, but actually being present to each other. Perhaps if we just sit quietly, we'll overhear a peace whispering through the centuries that's missing from the clamor of the moment. Maybe prayer means listening to the silences between the words, noticing the negativity of space, the vast, undifferentiated, and nameless wonder that underlies it all. Maybe prayer doesn't mean talking to God at all, but listening with the heart to the angel choirs all around us, 
those who have ears, let them hear. As children, people begin to teach us to speak in the very first months of our lives. They coax us to say mama, daddy, or whatever grandparent means in your family. They listen for any sound that is close to those names and they applaud every effort the baby makes. We get that when we are young. We are not, however, taught to listen. Adults don't, as a rule, ever say to the baby, listen, sweetie, hear that? Or what do you hear? We don't teach them how to listen, but later we will chastise or punish a child for not listening. We say, listen, listen as a command, as a demand, as a complaint, as a threat. When as adults, we are finally taught to listen, we are taught active listening. We learn techniques like mirroring and paraphrasing and checking for understanding and translating body language. Most of us are decent listeners. We listen for affirmation because we want people to know that we know that we're right. We listen for confirmation because we know that if we listen long enough, the person that we're listening to is gonna prove that we were right. And we listen for space to jump in with our own ideas. When I lived in the commune, before speaking in a group discussion, we had to say, I appreciate what you've said. And if I understand you correctly, now, we said it with great deference, but most of us didn't really mean it because we were just trying to get to our point. But what that statement did was slow us down and at least invite us to listen before we spoke. I appreciate what you said. If I understand you correctly, here's my response. Then in grad school or in professional development training, we learn things like critical listening. We learn to listen to find the error. We learn to listen to find the fault in the logic, to find the missing piece. And then when I taught speech class, we taught interruption techniques. We taught them, wait for the person to breathe because you can't talk and breathe at the same time. And when the person who's talking, talking, talking stops to breathe, you jump in and then you don't breathe until you make your point. Or as the person is winding down the end of the sentence, you jump in and say, that's a good point, and then keep going. Or you just talk over them with a big thank you and move on. And so these techniques are great in debate and they work in classrooms and other formal situations, but sometimes active listening tactics are not enough. You may be listening with the right actions, but you, and you may think about how you are listening, but it's also important to listen with the right attitude to feel with compassion about how you are listening and about the person you are listening to. For example, think about your attitude when you're listening to a joke that you've heard before or instructions for making a dish that you really enjoy or you're listening because you're preparing to mediate a disagreement between two people that you love. Perhaps you're listening to a friend whine again about the partner that they've had for 40 years and intend to keep. Each requires a different listening attitude. This morning, I invite you to think about listening. I think about listening with your brain and your heart. When you listen with your brain, you'll hear all the words that convey the facts, the data, the information related to the message. But is that the best way to listen? 
How many times do you get the words and miss the message? How often are you confused because you are using the same words as the person you're talking with, but you are talking about two different things? When you just use your brain, you may end up listening for the wrong things. If you're listening to the joke, are you listening, did they tell it right? Are you listening to say, am I willing to laugh still at this thing that I've heard so many times? Are you listening to hear is my friend awkwardly trying to make a connection with this small audience? If you're listening for the instructions for making a dish, are you listening to get all of the steps and ingredients? Or are you listening how this dish connects you to the person who's sharing the recipe with you or to the time that you ate it with that special person? If you're mediating an argument, are you listening to see who's right? Are you listening to notice what the other is missing? Are you listening because you care? Head or heart or both? Hafid said, how do I listen to others? I listen as if everyone was my beloved, speaking to me her cherished last words. How do I listen to you? I listen as if you were the alpha and the omega of all sound. This is the kind of listener you are. Without making me realize my soul's anguished history, you slip into my house at night, and while I'm sleeping, you silently carry off all of my suffering and sordid past in your beautiful hands. That is not the attitude I usually take when I'm listening. It is the attitude I aspire to. Because when you listen with your heart, it can become a spiritual practice. It can be first a practice of listening to your own heart. Rumi said, sit quietly and listen for a voice that will say, be more silent. As that happens, your soul starts to revive. Listen to the whispers of the universe. Listen to the voices of your gods. Khalil Gibran said, before my soul took me to task, I was hard of hearing. I heard only tumult and uproar. But now I'm all ears, listening to the silence and its choirs singing the hymns of time, intoning the praises of the firmament, revealing the secrets of the invisible. This listening as a spiritual practice is what allows you to sit with the loved ones and to sit with love and visit with your relatives or your friends or your used to be friends who are so much more conservative than you are or who are so different from you are or who are just plain nuts. It enables you to listen to someone who occupies a different world whose sense of reality is not yours. If you listen with your ears, they make no sense. But if you listen with your heart, you can perhaps feel what they are saying. And even more importantly, they will feel that you care. The most important thing that you can communicate when listening is I see you and I care. I see all of you. I see the parts of you that you project. I see the parts that others tease you about. I see the wounds and scars that you try to hide. I see your pain. I don't understand it all. I can't fix it, but I'm here and I'm listening. As you weep, I hold your heart in my heart. I believe everyone is capable of listening with their hearts. I also know that you can't listen to everyone who needs a listener. You have to decide what your capacity of listening is. 
And when the love of my life died a couple of years ago, after 10 people I love had died in the 10 previous months, my heart was very heavy. And what I learned and had to remember was that everyone doesn't have the capacity to listen to what I have to say, even then in the nadir of my existence, no matter how much they love me, just because they love me doesn't mean they can listen. That's what therapists are for. That's what ministers are for. That's what spiritual directors are for. That's what journals are for. Journals, not journalists, journals. Sometimes you need a professional listener. It doesn't mean that no one loves you. It means that your pain may be too great in this moment for a particular person to hold for you. Now, there's a spiritual tradition of listening across many faiths and traditions, sitting with mystics, holy listening, the 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 attitude of confession, the practice of confession, and then there's an assurance of pardon. So someone listens to your sins and then says you have been forgiven. The idea of spiritual direction, the attitude of meditation and contemplation, all of those are spiritual practices that use listening as the main device for getting you in touch with the deepest part of your soul. All of them are names for listening with the heart. It is the listening you do to show you care, to allow someone to work something out aloud, to hear what someone is trying to tell you, to hear what your heart is trying to say to you. And remember, just because someone is telling you their problems doesn't mean that you have to fix it, no matter how great you are at problem solving. And if you're not sure if they're asking you to fix it, just ask them. You can say, you know, I'm really happy to listen. Tell me what you want me to listen for. Do you want me to fix it? Do you want me to give advice? Do you want me to help you see another perspective? Do you want me to tell you that you're right? Do you want me to tell you that you're wrong? Just tell me and then do just that or tell them what you can't do. See, listening is a skill and it is an art. And so you don't want to ask people to do things that they can't do. As members of a friendship circle, we can talk with one another and we can take turns listening to the one who needs to be listened to in this moment. Sometimes the one person that you may want to talk to and just listen to how hurt you are may be the one person in your heart circle who can't do that. It is in their nature to not tell you what you need to hear because it is in their nature to see both sides. It is in their nature to fix things. It's in their nature to tell you how wrong you are. So you may not need to talk to them. They can't be a good listener for you. If you are the right person to listen, remember that the reality of the other person is not in what they reveal to you, but in what they cannot reveal to you. Therefore, if you would understand them, listen not to what they say, but rather to what they don't say. Don't analyze the words. Listen to the spaces between the words. Notice the feeling tone. Listen to what they're not saying and ask yourself, I wonder what else is going on? Ask yourself, why are they telling me this? Don't put yourself in their shoes. Their shoes will never fit you. Don't ask yourself, well, what would I do if I were them? You're not them. Sometimes the speaker is going to ask you for advice, and if you are listening with your heart, you will speak from your heart and say, I can't decide for you. I can't fix it for you. I can't make the pain go away. But I can listen. Sometimes you both need to listen with your heart. You need to listen to hear the woundedness of the other. 
You need to listen to hear the forgiveness of the other. You need to listen to hear the desire for reconciliation. Just listen. I can be a safe place for you to rant, for you to scream, for you to cry. Just listen. You can be a safe space for me to rant, for me to scream, for me to cry. May it be so for you as a listener and when someone listens to you. Please join me in our offering. There's a saying, give until it hurts, but true selfless giving of ourselves as well as our possessions should never hurt. The more we freely and willingly give, the more we give to ourselves. I ask that you share as much as you can and to know that we come together for more than ourselves. 50% of today's offering goes to the UUA Disaster Relief Fund. You can give with your smartphone. Text 844-982-0209 and put the amount you wish to donate in the body of the text, followed by the letters GCC. The first time you give in this way, you'll be asked to set it up. After that, it'll be simple. The number is 844-982-0209. And for more information on giving, you can focus your, your smartphone camera on the QR code in the corner of the screen.
Somebody's called my name Hodge Hodge Somebody's called my name Hodge Hodge Somebody's called my name Oh my Lord Oh my Lord What shall I do? Sounds like freedom Somebody's called my name Sounds like freedom Somebody's called my name Sounds like freedom Somebody's called my name Oh my Lord, oh my Lord, what shall I do? Sounds like justice, somebody's calling my name. Sounds like justice, somebody's calling my name. Sounds like justice Somebody's calling my name Oh my Lord, oh my Lord What shall I do? Soon one morning Death come creeping in my room Soon one morning Death come creeping in my room Soon one morning Death come creeping in my room Oh my Lord, oh my Lord What shall I do? So glad trouble don't last always. I'm so glad trouble don't last always. I'm so glad trouble don't last always. Oh, my Lord. service is over and our service to the world continues. Go now, go in peace and listen. Listen to your heart and listen to the hearts of others. Peace be with you, my friends. <laughs>